You probably know that force is a push or a pull, but what are the different types of forces? What is its unit? And how do we model things when there are multiple forces acting? Well, let's find out. Let's start with a concrete example. What are the different forces that you can identify on this particular chair? Well, let's see. The rope is pulling on the chair, right? Forces due to ropes or chains or cables are called tension force. It's a contact force and it's a pulling force. Okay, what other forces are acting? Well, you probably know that Earth attracts everything on it, right? That's the force of gravity. It's a pulling force. But what's important is that it's a non-contact force. You don't need to be in contact with Earth to experience the force of gravity. In fact, any two masses will experience, will, will pull each other with the force of gravity. So Earth and Moon pull each other um, with the force of gravity, the Sun and all the planets pull each other with the force of gravity and so on and so forth. All right, what else? Well, because of gravity, the chair is being pushed into the floor. And as a result, the floor is going to push back up on the chair. And this force is going to be perpendicular or normal to the surface. So we call this the normal force. It's a pushing force as well. The normal force is a contact force which is always perpendicular to the surface. Well, you can probably feel that if this surface was very rough and the chair was very heavy, then sliding it was gonna be very hard. And that's because surfaces are not smooth. At a microscopic level, there are irregularities. And when you try to slide them across, look, there will be some resistance. And that is what we call frictional force. It's a pulling force. It tends to oppose relative motion between surfaces. Let's take another example. What do you think will happen if you were to place a heavy ball on a spring? Well, because of gravity, it's going to push down and compress the spring. And you probably know that when you try to compress a spring, the spring tends to uncompress, and as a result, it'll push back on the ball. This force is what we call a spring force. It's a contact force, and it can be both a push or a pull. So in this particular case, it's pushing, but if you were to stretch a spring, it'll try to pull itself together. So in that case, the spring force would be a pulling force. Okay, now let's consider a submarine moving underwater. Can you pause and think about the different forces that could be acting on it? Okay, for, first of all, we know there is a force of gravity. But what else? Well, how does the submarine accelerate forward? That's due to a force called thrust. Whenever an object pushes a mass in one direction, the mass pushes back on the object in the opposite direction. That force is the thrust. In this example, the submarine pushes on the water in the backward direction, and so the water will push the submarine in the forward direction that generates the thrust. Are there any other forces? Yes, whenever an object is moving through a fluid, meaning gas or liquids, the fluids resist the motion by pushing it in the opposite direction. We call that the drag force. And all fluids produce drag. For example, consider a rocket accelerating upwards. We know that there is a force of gravity acting on it. Okay, but how does it accelerate forward? How does it accelerate upwards? Well, by pushing down on hot gases. And these hot gases will push back up on the rocket. That's thrust. But air is a fluid. And so when the rocket moves through air, it experiences a drag force in the opposite direction. Both the thrust and drag forces are contact forces and they're pushing forces. Okay, coming back to the submarine, is there any other force over here? Yes. Fluids exert pressure, and that pressure increases with depth. Therefore, the bottom of the submarine experiences a slightly higher pressure from the surrounding fluid compared to the top of the, you know, compared to the top. As a result, there is a net upward force. That's called the buoyant force. It's a pushing force, it's a contact force, and it's what's responsible for making things float. In fact, submarines can control the balance between gravity and buoyant forces by letting the water into its tank or expelling it. And that's how they can float up towards the surface or sink deep below or even maintain a particular depth. And yes, if you're wondering, a rocket will also experience a buoyant force because air is a fluid. All fluids produce buoyant forces. But when it comes to a rocket, the buoyant force is so tiny compared to these forces that we completely ignore it. And guess what, there are many more forces, but what's important for us is that we can see that forces have both a magnitude and a direction. So forces are vector quantities. And the unit of a force is Newton, and it's usually written with a capital N. But now that brings us to the main question, 
how do we model situations when there are multiple forces acting on an object? Well, let's take a concrete example. The box shown is pulled by a stretch spring with a force of 200 newtons. There's a stretch spring. And by a rope with a force of 160 newtons. The gravitational and normal force on the box are 80 newtons each. What is the net force on the box? So how do we do this? Well, the first step is to draw what we call a free body diagram. What's that? Well, the idea is you take the object of interest, which is basically the box over here, Okay, you represent it as a dot, and the dot represents its center of mass. And then you draw all the force vectors on this object originating from this dot. Okay, so here's what I mean, all right? So we know that there is a 200 newtons of pulling spring force acting on it. So it's the spring is pulling on the box to the left with a force of 200 newtons. So let's draw that. So we're gonna draw a spring force of 200 newtons um, acting on this object. And notice it's originating from the dot. That's what we mean over here, okay? Then we have the rope pulling with the force of 160 newtons. So that is to the right. That is the tension force. And what's important over here is that the length of the arrow mark must be proportional to the magnitudes of the force. All right, what are the forces? Well, there's a gravitational force acting downwards. So that's 80 newtons. And there's also a normal force. That's the pushing force. The, the, the floor is pushing up on it. That's also, 80 newtons. So these are all the forces acting on the body and this is our free body diagram. Notice that we only draw forces acting on the body. We don't draw the forces, for example, acting on the floor or on the rope or on the spring. We only draw the ones that are acting on the object of interest, the, bo the box over here. Okay, now that we have these forces, what do we do next? Next up, we consider forces in the horizontal separately and the vertical separately. So you can consider this as X direction, Y direction separately. And if there's Z direction, there could be forces in Z direction as well. We consider them separately. So let's only now consider the forces in the vertical, the Y direction, okay? So the, the what is the net force acting in the Y direction, the total force acting in the Y direction? Well, we need to sum these two things up. But remember, forces are vectors, so we need to use signs. We can consider any one direction as positive and now the other direction would be negative. So let's consider the upwards as positive, then the downwards would become negative. So that means we take the normal force as a positive number and notice since we have a gravity acting downwards, we'll take that as a negative number. So we do minus Fg. You are completely free to choose whichever direction you want to be positive or negative, okay? Anyways, substituting over here, the normal force is 80 minus the gravitational force is also 80, giving us zero. So the net force in the vertical is zero. That makes sense. The two forces are equal and opposite. They cancel out. Now let's consider the forces in the horizontal, which we often call the X direction. What is the net force over here? It would be a great idea to pause the video and figure this out yourself. All right, let's choose the right side to be positive again. Completely my choice. So we'll have a positive tension force and then we'll have the negative spring force. Okay, so if you plug in, we get 160 newtons of tension force minus 200 newtons of the spring force. That gives us a minus 40 newtons. That's the net force. What does the minus sign represent? Well, it says, hey, we chose right side to be positive. So the minus sign is saying that the net force should be towards the left. And that makes sense. The leftward force is bigger, the spring force is bigger than the tension force, so it makes intuitive sense that the net force in the horizontal should be towards the left. So the net force in the horizontal is 40 newtons to the left. The net force in the vertical is zero. So what's the total force? Well, since the vertical forces add up to become zero, they completely cancel out. The net force acting on this body is just 40 newtons to the left. There we have it. Okay, here's the next example. A hot air balloon is rising and drifting left through the air. The gravitational force on the balloon is 4,000 newtons. And the buoyant force is 10,000 newtons. The vertical and the horizontal drag forces on the balloon are 2,500 newtons and 5,000 newtons respectively. Find the magnitude of the net force on the balloon. Again, it'll be a great idea to pause the video and see if you can draw the free body diagram yourself and then work it out and find the net force. Okay. Let's do this. So our object of interest this time is the balloon. So let's draw a dot for that. And let's try to draw all the force vectors. What are the different force vectors? Well, we know the gravitational force acting on the balloon is 4,000 newtons. So there's a downward force of gravity. I'm, I'm not writing down the numbers over here, um, but that is 4,000 newtons, okay? And make sure that the magnitude is proportional to the length. And then we have the buoyant force, which always acts upwards. 
and that is 10,000 newtons. Okay, then we have the vertical and the horizontal drag forces. Remember, drag forces are always opposite to the direction of the motion. This balloon is rising up, therefore there is a vertical downward drag force, and this balloon is also moving to the left, so there is a rightward drag force as well. So the vertical drag force, which is downwards because the balloon is rising, okay, it's always in the opposite direction of the motion, remember, that is 2,500 newtons. So it's a downward drag force acting as well, okay? And then we have a 5,000 newtons of drag force acting horizontally. Since the balloon is moving to the left, the drag force should be to the right. So there is a 5,000 newtons of drag force acting um, horizontally as well. And that's it. These are all the forces acting on my balloon. So now we can analyze the situation. We can just look at the X direction, the horizontal, and the Y direction separately. Let's start with the X direction. What is the net force acting in the X direction? Hey, there's only one force acting. <laughs> there are no other forces. So the net force in the X direction is just the horizontal drag force, 5,000 newtons. And what is the direction? To the right. So we can just say that's the net force in the X direction. Okay, what about the net force in the Y direction? Well, again, we need to think about one direction as positive, use the signs and add them up. Again, feel free to pause if you hadn't tried this earlier and try this yourself. Okay, let me just choose the upwards to be positive. So if I do that, the buoyant force becomes positive and these two become negative. So we have the positive buoyant force, we have the negative gravitational force, and then we also have the negative, the vertical, the vertical um, drag force, okay? So plugging in, the buoyant force is 10,000 newtons, gravity is 4,000, and the drag force in the vertical direction is 2,500 newtons. Well, if you plug in the numbers, you get 3,500 newtons. And since it's a positive number, that means it's in the positive direction. And again, it makes intuitive sense because the buoyant force is much larger than these two forces combined. As you can see, that's 10,000, and these two combined is 6,500. So the net force in the y direction is upwards. And there we have it. We have calculated the net force in the X direction and the net force in the Y direction.